Welcome to Hesitancy, Equity, and Transparency in conversation with pastor and lawmaker James D. Galliard on the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. My name is Merlene Tucker, and I'm here with my colleague, Jeff Bornstein. Together, we'll be running this Dialogue for Health web forum. Thank you to our partners for today's event, the Public Health Institute and Impact International, an affiliate of the American Institutes for Research. I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to today's moderator, Dr. Mary Pittman, the president and CEO of the Public Health Institute. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much, Merlene. And I wanna thank everyone who has joined us for today's webinar. Before we jump into the session today, I want to review our discussion in the first session, since many of you were not there. Um, we were joined by the panelists, Dr. Bashar Shakir, the White House Vaccination Coordinator, Dr. Jeffrey Reynoso, Executive Director of the Latino Coalition for a Healthy California, and Senator Mary Knish of Minnesota. Our panelists shared their perspectives from working at the federal, state, and local levels and what they learned in their respective approaches. The next slide shows the key lessons that we learned from that web forum. An important one is providing the right message through the right channels can help build vaccine confidence and acknowledging that the past trauma experienced by communities um, can uh, increase trust and decrease vaccine hesitancy. Communication campaigns and approaches need to use plain language and recognize that healthcare decisions are not a one size fit all. And collecting, synthesizing, and visualizing data requires partnerships, cross-sector partnerships, so that we can identify and direct resources appropriately to the vulnerable communities. And finally, that legislatures must work with community stakeholders to develop long-term long policy measures that improve health equity and prepare for future public health emergencies. And fortunately, today we'll be dealing with uh, that last issue um, in, in more detail. For today's learning objectives, we will be learning more about how faith-based organizations can build trust and confidence in communities, identify barriers that impact equitable COVID-19 vaccine access, and actionable approaches to overcome them that have been tried. Learn how to identify and build relationships with trusted community partners, and identify and evaluate the effectiveness and establishing best practices and trustworthiness. And that's something that I think is a, a, a long term strategy. So uh, this is a start of a conversation. And then finally, learn how to better prepare for future pandemics or public health emergencies. So if I could uh, move, please, to the next slide. So it's really my uh, great honor today to introduce uh, James Pastor and Representative James David Galliard. And he is uh, a senior pastor at the World Tabernacle Church, which is a mega church serving thousands of families in North Carolina and Virginia. He is also the founder of the REACH Center, which helps to equip individuals to secure gainful employment, prevent homelessness, and break the cycle of violence through education, skills development, and connections to community resources. Mr. Galliard was reelected in 2020 as representative for the House District 25, representing Nash County and Rocky Mount in the North Carolina General Assembly. And he's the first African-American to hold that seat. So with that, I wanna welcome uh, Pastor and Representative Galliard to uh, our dialogue today. So let's get started with our discussion and welcome. As a pastor and community leader and legislator, what concerns have you seen surrounding COVID-19 vaccines and how they've impacted your work, both as a pastor and as a representative? Sure, well, Dr. Pittman, thank you very much for having me and thank you for your work at the Institute. It's really significant, particularly in this time. Um, so jumping in, you know, I think the concerns for me have been around how we have to do a better job at, at our networks and our partnerships and our collaborations. When you have an issue like COVID hit, 
and you're trying to get a grassroots movement formed where you're taking a federal asset, getting it through the states and then getting it into local communities without having a really, really solid network already established. Um, it's a really, really heavy lift. And so I think the frustration for me that I've seen, and we all know that COVID has really exacerbated. I mean, it's really proven on what our real challenges are in a, in a different kind of way. And so both as a community leader and as a pastor and as a state legislator, I'm seeing the need um, around more robust networks um, and, and, and more infrastructure, so to speak, particularly in our rural communities. I serve in a rural community um, Rocky Mountain is only about 55,000 people. And, and so making sure that we are able to penetrate those under-resourced networks with all of the, with everything those communities needs, I think is, is really where service for me is one of the big issues here. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, with your multiple roles, it's really quite interesting that you're able to see how those flow of funds go down. And I know in our experience at, at PHI, we've served as somewhat of an intermediary role, particularly to help get funds out to community-based organizations, because it, it's sometimes a slower pipeline and it's more challenging. Have you done a, a similar process in North Carolina? We, we have, and, and it's been painful in some regards. And so, you know, as you know, what happens is money leaves the feds, it hits the states, and then the states it hits a state agency. And then from a state agency, they're looking to interface with local community partners. If they don't have those community partners from day one, then they have to figure out where are those partners. And then they have to figure out, do those partners have the infrastructure to be able to do what we need them to do? Do they have the staff? Do they have the technical resources? Do they have the computer resources? Do, you know, and, in, and I'll give you an example for a program that we ran here. And, and you mentioned in the introduction, we have a separate nonprofit called the REACH Center. And so we were one of the intermediaries for tens of millions of dollars for housing uh, for the state of North Carolina. And we were just fortunate because our cash flow enabled us to really help, but every nonprofit didn't have that ability. And so, you know, there were times where we were waiting on four or $500,000 in, in reimbursement to come back to us in terms of what we had already spent. So every nonprofit can't do that. I would argue most can't do that. And so I think, and this is a huge frustration for me with COVID, I, we're so anxious to get out of it. And trust me, I am too, right? I'm a pastor. I want to hug people. I want to interact with people. But I'm more interested in learning from it and building the infrastructure, building the networks, building the collaboration so that when the next issue hits, we have in place what's needed to more successfully and more quickly navigate through it. I can totally relate to that. And I think what we're what we're experiencing, and, and we've had the same experience of having to put money up front, but I, I think what we're experiencing is an opportunity to reimagine what our public health systems look like. And it's government plus partnerships with nonprofits, community-based organizations, a whole variety. And, and we know that it takes that full component and it sounds like you're experiencing the same. Could you tell me a little bit, you know, in our in our last webinar, we used the term vaccine hesitancy. And at PHI, we've flipped it. And instead of emphasizing hesitancy, we've been talking about what's it take to build confidence. Can you talk about what vaccine hesitancy means in your community and what you've been trying to do to, you know, flip it in your own right? And then what about the way it's portrayed in the media? Sure, those are great questions. And so one of my favorite things to talk about is how we oftentimes use the same words but different dictionaries. And, and so we use the term hesitancy, but I don't think we're defining it the same way because what we see at the grassroots community level is very different than what we talk about nationally. So most times nationally, when they're talking about hesitancy, it's around the vaccine itself, right? It's, it's whether or not I get vaccinated. But when you get to the grassroots level, that's only one of three elements of hesitancy. And this is where I think we've missed it in terms of getting more needles in arms. So the first level, think about what has to happen before I actually get the needle in the arm. The first thing that's gotta happen is that someone's picking up the phone calling me. You know, they're, they're just randomly calling people, hey, you know, we're, we're vaccinating this age group, we're vaccinating this group, the vaccine is offered here. Nine times out of 10, the person making that phone call has no connection to the person answering the phone. 
So they're not using trusted partners in the community. They're not using the deacons or the trustees at the church. They're not using the staff of the Boys and Girls Club. They're using you know, some fresh out of college intern who just graduated, who knows nothing about the community at all. So the person on the other end of this phone, phone call, especially if it's a senior citizen, they're like, who is this person I'm talking to? Like, I already don't, I don't know you and I don't trust you. So the answers already know because the first level of hesitancy is hit. The second level of hesitancy people don't talk about is where is the vaccine being offered? So in every community, the health department does not have the same reputation. So if the, if the states are relying upon health, the health, the health clinics or the health, the health county health departments to be the ones initially offering the vaccine, which was the case here in Eastern North Carolina. Well, here in Eastern North Carolina, oftentimes the health department is kind of where you go if you have an STD or if you can't go anywhere else. And I don't really want to see my friends seeing me at the health department. So then there's a hesitancy there. And then you get to, well, can I really trust the vaccine? What is being said in the community about the vaccine? Where does vaccine come from? Why did it get to market too quick? Then you're dealing with all those elements. So when you add those three pieces together, that's where you get the overall issue of hesitancy in the rural community, the African-American community, and I think even throughout the state. And what we've seen in North Carolina is when we get the phone call right in the beginning, when we start having trusted um, partners in the community making those phone calls, um, when we start using churches, and community centers and places that pre people frequent and have been to as the vaccination location. When we start doing those things, then the, the number of people hesitant for the actual vaccination decreases. Yeah, that that's great. And you know, have you done anything in particular to try to educate the media in your local area about those issues? I have, you know, fortunately, I'm, I'm in the General Assembly. And so as a result of that, I get the opportunity to kind of use a different tool based upon what's going on. And so, you know, I beat this message with our Department of Health and Human Services and, and the governor staff and people. But it's a difficult message at first. I mean, it's very difficult for people to hear this because we have these images of ourselves that we don't exactly want people to speak opposite of. And it's not to be disparaging against any group of people. It's just about people understanding that sometimes what happens on the ground is a little bit different than what kind of happens in people's heads further removed. And so I think we've been successful. We have a ministerial alliance here and that's a channel by which we can get some of our messaging out as well that way. Can you talk, you've, you've touched on it, but can you talk a little bit more about what are the routine sources of information that your church members rely on um, for COVID and the vaccine? Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on social media and you know local health providers. Um, which sources do they tend to trust the most? And um, you know what can we do to reinforce that? Yeah, so we have what's called standard of care within our congregation. And we try to encourage other congregations to use the same. And I know this is a term I've seen in different public health environments as well. For us, a standard of care means if we have a 15 year old and we have an 85 year old, how do we find a way to get that 15 year old and the 85 year old the information they need? So for us, the trusted resources are everything you've mentioned. It's social media, but it's postcards. It's handwritten notes going home to people. You know, so our members that are 65 and older, they get a phone call every Monday from someone on our staff saying, hey, we're checking on you, particularly when COVID first hit. Does someone need to get groceries for you? Do you need anything? And then we're, we're writing on a regular basis, handwritten notes. So we're not just relying on graphics on social media and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We're using all of those outlets, but we also have gone old school. My mom is 88 years old. She lives with me. You know, she wants the newsletter, she wants a letter, and, and that's how she wants to get her information. So I think the important thing here is that we look at every possible venue, every possible outlet as a way to be able to interact with people. And I think historically we've not done that. And so we have found that we've got to use all of those elements in order to get to everybody. I do think one of the mistakes that was made in COVID is that we spent too much time on traditional television media communication and not enough time on social media everybody was stuck on their computer because of zoom because of webex because of whatever everybody was stuck on their computer 
and we were not infiltrating, saturating those airways with the message, we were still going to traditional outlets like TV. And it has its place, but I think we could have been more aggressive um, taking advantage of the media outlets. Now, I will say this in, in closing on this question, Mary, is I think it's important to insert that information within a context of a trusted provider. So as an example, the, the graphic or the message that comes out from, from DHHS or from whatever health entity there is, it's different on the CDC's website versus on the Boys and Girls Club website versus United Way's website. Sure. It's different when I'm saying it as a part of pastoral emphasis on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've got to be able to really insert and embed that messaging into community-based partnerships to really get it across the finish line. That's great. So you take the evidence-based message that the research and the experts at CDC and at your local, at your state health department have crafted, and then you just put it in a different context, perhaps a different graphic, different media, and just keep reinforcing it. That's yeah, perfect. that's brilliant. We had one question from the audience that I'm going to take right now because I think it's relevant, which is, do you believe some of the hesitancy in getting the vaccine was because of how quickly it seemed to be available on a mass scale after the novel virus began? You know, uh, what, what can be done to reassure people that it was done with great rapidity, um, but because of the focus on it and, you know, how can we reassure people? What have you yeah, that's doing? a great question. And, and I do think that is a portion of the hesitancy, but I do think it can be combated. We've seen this. I've been on, I can't name how many panel discussions nationally on this issue. And what we found is that when we bring healthcare providers, researchers, public health professionals that are not relying on their expertise and their degrees to be trusted, but are relying on their social networks to be trusted, so as an example, when the AKAs or fraternities or sororities or Masonic lodges or Eastern Stars or civic clubs, when they begin hosting these events and then the doctors on those events start explaining, hey, this is how it got to market so quick. This is why it's safe. This is why you should take it. Then I think it, 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 it alleviates the hesitancy. But I do think there's a bigger issue here and I, and I'm, I, I hesitate. <laughs> to say a bigger issue when you're talking about an issue as big as COVID. But I think the bigger issue is our lack of knowledge as a society on how we get drugs, on how we get vaccinations, on, on how long it takes. I mean, because, I mean, we all, we know that they didn't just start working on the COVID vaccine when COVID hit, right? We knew there were some, there was a lot of activity that had been going on for a while, but most people are just clueless about how any of this happens. You know, I pop a Tylenol when I have a headache and I'm clueless how you wind up with acetaminophen, right? I don't know, right? So I think this points to a bigger issue for us that it's an opportunity for us to really educate society on how we deal with this in general so that when we get these issues that we have to micromanage, we're not starting from scratch. From scratch. Uh, that's a really good point. That, um you know, overall science, and then particularly, you know, how drugs are manufactured and, and get to market. That's, that's a, an important topic that we should take up at a future time. Can you talk a little bit from your policy perspective on the measures that North Carolina has prioritized to try to help ensure that you had an equitable vaccine distribution? Yeah, that, that, well, let me just, <laughs> for fear of offending, you know, my, fellow state legislators and the wonderful staff we have at the Department of Health and Human Services, I'm of the position that we did not begin with equity. Um, I think there was a lot of scratching, a lot of fighting, a lot of advocating that got us to equity. We started with, we started with speed. And you know, the argument, and, and I get it to a certain extent, we were dealing with a federal asset and the way that federal asset was being distributed to the states you had to be able to quote unquote, burn these doses, right? You had to be able to get them in arms. The only way I can ensure to get them in arms is to get to places, large communities, right? Big, big metropolitan areas. So that, 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 that emphasis on speed hurt us on the equity side in the beginning. 
and we had some catching up work to do. And so I think in the beginning of North Carolina, because we were, we were operating that way, again, we had catch up work to do, but we started, we started developing partnerships with churches, with nonprofits. We started bringing, we, I'm gonna tell you who was a huge, what was huge for us, fairly qualified health centers. You know, so, you know, this is like, sometimes you look at an issue, Mary, and you're like, duh, really? I, did I miss it that obviously? But when you have an FQHC in a community and 95% of their database is African-American or Latinx, then you don't need to wait to get them the vaccine if you want equity, you know, get them the vaccine. Now I will say we had to fight to really get FQHCs on board quickly. I think we onboarded them a little slow. I would have liked to have seen us onboard them a little bit quicker. Um, to their defense, sometimes they didn't have all the infrastructure they needed. This was difficult because as you know, we needed to have refrigeration and there were elements to it that we didn't always have to deal with in terms of vaccines. But I think for us, it was finally recognizing speed and balance of equity, how we got to that balance and then bringing to the table as quickly as possible, um, our FQHCs, um, our pharmacies, um, our primary cares, every, because everybody had their own sphere of influence and their own group that they had an expertise in. Um, and so I think those were some of the things that really helped here in North Carolina. Well, building on those lessons, I know everyone is longing for a post-pandemic environment. And um, I'm wondering what are some of the long-term policy measures that we can take from those lessons that you just outlined to help reduce the disparities and to prepare communities, not only for a future pandemic, but a future way that we address those people who have not always received the services that they're eligible for or in need of? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think for me, one of the answers is we have in North Carolina, and I'm not sure how other states are designed, we have area health education centers and they are, our state is divided regionally. I think we have 16 in the state. And so those area health education centers have within them certain counties that they operate in. They really are kind of the experts about what goes on in their counties. I think we brought our AHECs, our area health education centers, we brought our AHECs to the table a little late, in my opinion. And I think the learning and the takeaway is we have these existing structures and these existing resources, and we have to do a better job of resourcing them and equipping them and empowering them to do the work that they can do well. What DHHS can offer is different than what I can offer at the local level with my area health education center where I can really micromanage um, the resources. Um, I think the other big takeaway for me is our data, and we may get into this later, I'm not sure, but I think one piece of data that's really important is zip codes. Um, because we, I don't know how it is in other places in the country, but here, because it's a federal asset, the COVID vaccination that is, you know, COVID vaccine, when it came into Nash County where, where my church is and where I legislate from, a person from 30 miles, 50 miles, 80 miles, 100 miles away could have driven into that community to get the vaccine if it was available there and not available in their community. Or someone could come across from Virginia into North Carolina. So what we were late doing that we have to do a better job of legislatively is making sure that we can take that data and disaggregate it to say, okay, in a certain county, there were a thousand vaccines given, but of those thousand vaccines in this zip code, how many people in this zip code were actually vaccinated? Because what we discovered is that when you started looking at those other zip codes that had high populations of African-Americans, high populations of Latinx, um, higher poverty rates, um, less available resources in terms of um, physicians and et cetera, those percentages were much smaller in those zip codes. But the county looked great. The region looked great, but we didn't disaggregate, disaggregate that data. So for me, as a legislator, that's a huge takeaway in terms of how we have to manage um, and analyze our data as we move forward. Yeah, that's a really great point. I want to spend a couple of uh, moments talking about some of the implementation challenges. And I know that we have some questions from our audience as well about the actual vaccine and you know, the pause in um, 
distributing the J and J vaccine and what impact that had, and people thinking that it might not be as good as the other vaccines, and how do we get over that uh, perception? And then the second thing is uh, a lot of people went and got their first vaccine, and Moderna and Pfizer required two shots. And in some cases, for harder to reach populations, they opted for the J and J. So there was a question, you know, um, you know, is this a discriminatory use of the vaccine? And I think you'd have a, a different response if you had, a, you know, a scientist talking about it. But how did you deal with those various perceptions in your communities? Yeah, that's a great question. Let me tell you, we had a J&J &J drive-in clinic. We had fought so hard to get a massive number of vac vaccines available. And we were gonna do a one day that was drive-in appointments inside the church, appointments in the parking lot, I mean, drive-through, and we would go homebound, right? And it was all J&J. &J. And the bottom fell out 48 hours before the event. And so we still did well. Not We didn't burn all the vaccines like we wanted to because we did take a hit. But this is what we learned from it. First of all, consistent messaging is so important. And the consistent messaging from day one for us was the best vaccine is the vaccine available. We, we have been saying that and we continue saying that. And so when people started coming after the J&J &J, you know, issue that we had or that went on nationally and the J&J &J was back, back in rotation, and when they, they, we would tell them what we had available, they, they were so used to hearing the best, best vaccine is the one available that it really didn't matter as much what the vaccine was. The second thing about the J&J &J for us is the governor of North Carolina, the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services both took the J&J &J vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and I took you know, the J&J &J vaccine and we recorded it and then we televised it. Um, and so we started looking for people that we knew had good voices of influence to say, would you take the J&J &J vaccine? Um, and it worked for us. Um, and we even had a, an event with Pfizer employees volunteered at the event to distribute the J&J &J vaccine. So I think depending on how you message it, depending on how truthful you are with people, and we, it's very important in messaging that we not react. We have to have enough on the ground grassroots influence that we already know what people are struggling with and what they're thinking. And we have to get the message and the narrative out ahead of their narrative of concern. And a lot of times we're waiting for people and we have to jump in first and say, hey, let me tell you, this is the narrative. This is what we want you to understand. And then when we started giving people data, you know, of and I forget what the numbers were now, but I literally, we calculated the physician in my, and I at one point, and the, the, you know, the J and J vaccine was like 99.99998%, you know, okay. Like the number was so small. Right. And the other thing I'll just, you know, and, and if I'm getting too lengthy, just tell me I'm a preacher by nature. So I talk. So, um, but, but the other thing for me goes to, again, educating people around the process of medication and, and how there are issues, they may be rare, but what I said to my congregation is, listen to an infomercial of any drug. It doesn't matter what the drug is. And if you listen to the infomercial, you're gonna start hearing. It could cause blindness, it could cause hardness of hearing, it could cause weight loss, it could even cause death. Like you're gonna hear it with 100% of medications. Right. So, Again, it's helping people connect those dots. You know, so overall, I think that people were fine. We got on the other side of the J&J &J issue and I have not seen how it's been a major issue for us here in North Carolina. I am personally a huge advocate of the J&J &J vaccine in certain communities. And this is the reason why. When you need two vaccines and you don't have any health insurance and you don't have any paid time off, and the only place in your community offers the vaccine between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And the only way you can get it is to take three hours off from work that you're not going to get paid for. It is easier for me to do that one time than two times. You complicate that with an aging mother or father at home. 
that you have to take off from work to get to the provider so they can get the vaccine. Again, it is easier for us to do that one time than two times if there is a response. You know, I had about 12 horrible hours with the J&J, &J, then I felt fine. I was not real smart because I took it on a Saturday and I had to preach on Sunday morning. <laughs> so, but one of the physicians in my church, when I complained about how bad I was feeling, said to me, imagine feeling everything you're feeling and being on a ventilator for six weeks. Right, right. And then I yeah. shut my mouth immediately. The alternative so. is worse. That's right. <laughs> yeah, can you also talk to me? I know you did a lot of outreach directly to the homes, and I think you had mobile vans that went to some communities as well. Um, what about for people who had a hard time when you had to sign up for vaccines? What were some of the strategies that you used and to get people who might not have been tech savvy or didn't have a, a computer or broadband or whatever? What kinds of strategies did you use? Yeah, that's a great question. We commandeered, we wrestled away the scheduling widget from the providers. And so we literally, because this was a huge issue. So we started saying to providers, listen, block us off X number of time slots, X number of slots. We're going to schedule them ourselves. We'll give you the names. And then eventually, once we got trusted with doing that, and then we started making phone calls. Hey, Mrs. Smith. This is thus and such from Word Tabernacle Church. We have a 10 a.m. slot next week available for the vaccine. Can we put you down? And then that senior citizen didn't have to worry about jumping through all those hurdles. So we, we took all of the information we had from our church databases, community databases and all that, and we did our own scheduling. And then eventually, once we got trusted with the providers with that, they started trusting us with the actual scheduling widget. And we could go in and just go ahead and do the scheduling. So for us, that was one of the workarounds. That's great. Yeah, very much hands on, you know, and something like this that's novel, that's new, people are unsure, trusted voices and hands on approach. I want to switch us a second to data. You mentioned that earlier and the importance of data. It sounds like you and uh, colleagues, both at the church and in the legislature, are pretty savvy. Um, and you said you didn't start out with an equity index, but did you collect data on race and um, ethnicity and perhaps language needs in yeah. your state? That, to my, you know, to our credit, uh, Mandy Cohen and, and her staff, North Carolina was one of the first states to report on race um, and ethnicity. And I, I, I'm really, now the downside of it was they had us legislators down their throat every time we were looking at the dashboard, not liking what we saw, but at least we had the data. Right. And so, yes, we did report on that. And in the early days, Mary, it was frustrating because we would, I was looking at data because our state dashboard would give it to us of uh, the number of COVID cases by race percentage. We would compare that to the percentage of that racial group in terms of the state population. We would compare that to first vaccine doses and second vaccine doses. And in the early days, the, your lines went either straight up or straight down based upon your race. So in the early, in the early days of the vaccine, if I was white my, and, and I had X number of, of cases, my first dose count was here, my second dose count was here, and man, they were trending straight up. If I was black or Latinx, it was trending straight down. And so we, wanted, we worked hard to get those, those lines leveled out, but we could do that because our state did report on it. So. Yeah. I think we've done a great job of reporting on, on, on race and on ethnicity. The only thing I think I would have done differently if we had the capacity is I would have reported on zip code much quicker. Okay, that's really important. Um, and did you make that data publicly available? Yes, that data was available on the Department of Health and Human Services website. We actually literally, um, we could, we could, it was an algorithm that was out there. So we literally, many of us in the General Assembly, we were posting it on our social media every day when it updated. And so for people that were either following me as a state legislator or following me as a pastor, I would post that on my personal Facebook page and on my legislative Facebook page. And we would show the numbers and we would show people, this is how you get the data. This is what you click on. This is what you look for, pull up your county. And I know for me, 
in the early, probably the first six months that we were fighting COVID, I was posting those numbers on a daily basis. This is where we're at. We've got to work harder. Do you think you'll continue doing that for other health issues? Do you think you'll continue doing it for hypertension rates, for uh, diabetes, for other things in the future to try to get people to change their behavior? You are asking my favorite question right now because that's exactly what I hope the outcome will be. And I'm, I'm huge on adaptive leadership. And I took a step back to say, what are we missing in terms of addressing social determinants of health? What do we miss in terms of dealing with health disparities? And I think you're spot on. I think we use this approach, data, trusted community partners, um, consistent messaging, repetition. Uh, we continue to do this to address all of the other issues we have, childhood diabetes, childhood obesity. I mean, the list just goes on and on. So to answer your question, yes. Um, and that is exactly what a, one of our agenda items um, as a result of COVID. Well, you know, I'm a bullish person on partnerships, and we talked about that earlier, the need for government, nonprofits, community-based organizations, faith organizations to partner together. Um, you know, we've done it with, in some communities well. Can you share tips for others who are trying to craft those successful partnerships? Like yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So. It's a three-prong approach, and I literally have done webinars on this. It's a three-prong approach for us. The first is identifying the partner. The second the part of it is developing the partner, and then how do you evaluate the partner? Um, and so as an example for us, and I'm talking more as a senior pastor now than as a legislator, but it's somewhat what's similar, is, is identify, the first step for me in identifying those partnerships is Entities have to ask themselves, who do we have within a certain community that knows how to leverage their captive audience already? It's not about whether or not they're doing it with about health issues, but are they leveraging a captive audience for any reason? Whether it is politics, whether it is housing, whether it is Black Lives Matter, whether it is education, whether it is police reform, do we have any trusted, any partners in the community that know how to leverage captive audiences? That's step one, figuring out who they are because to, to, to suddenly encourage a, a faith entity or community-based organization to utilize their influence for a social good that's not within how they view themselves is a very difficult sell. And so that's step one for us is just figuring out who those entities are. I think the second step what we tell people in terms of developing those partnerships is it has to be an organization that has a built-in infrastructure. Now that sounds like a given, but many nonprofits, many churches, many community-based organizations really lack infrastructure and capacity. They really have influence because of like a charismatic leader. You know, some person that people just like, somebody just trust, but they don't really have infrastructure. The reason I say it's important to have the infrastructure is because you don't want partnerships that are suddenly gone when people leave. And we've seen this with academia, we've seen this within our community. So it's built on the senior pastor, but suddenly he leaves. And now the university system is like, well, where, what do we do with this? So it has to have an entity that has infrastructure. And I could go on and on about this, so I'll just give you just one more. And then it has to be an organization that has has financial ability that is sustainable independent of this partnership. And now that's important for two reasons. Sometimes partnerships don't carry any funding with it at all. And that's fine because sometimes we just need to get the work done. But it has to be an organization that doesn't have so much burden on it that if it did one more thing, it would be its tipping point and it would no longer effectively be able to do its core operation. Similarly, it has to be an organization that if it did get funded for the partnership, and we've done zillions of these, we're doing one with UNC Gillen School of Public Health right now, it's been a great partnership. It has to be, we, we have to have the ability that if we did not have this partnership and these grant dollars, that it would have no impact upon us at all in terms of how we work. And so those are some of the initial thoughts that jump out for me in terms of developing some community partnerships. Um, it, it 
reminds me that one of the programs in California that I've been most excited about is philanthropies coming together in a program called Together Toward Health that have allowed us to provide funding to smaller community-based organizations doing great work where it may be one or two people, they don't have the infrastructure, but we're able to get core dollars out to them at the same time we're giving them program dollars, we're giving them some training and a little bit so that they can be building some of that capacity for the future. And I think that as we're looking at these programs, one of the things we want to do is leave behind community-based organizations that are stronger than when they started. So I'm, I'm sure we're in agreement on that. We are. One of, when I get to the evaluation portion of talking about, you know, and that could be another webinar for another time, but when I get to the evaluation portion, one of the things I say to, to academics or whoever's forming these partnerships, government entities, you want to ask yourself, what did we leave behind? How did we make this nonprofit stronger? What are they able to do now in our absence, now that we're gone? Because it can be a little unkind if you, you know, fund a nonprofit for five years. They're used to a certain level of influence within a certain dynamic. The funding goes away, and now it's as if nothing ever happened. And so to be able to leave them with an infrastructure to build future relationships and for the community to build future relationships, I'm, I'm elated to hear you say that that's happening because it is so important. And we'll have an evaluation coming out on how that happened because we think it's a good story to share. We only have uh, about 15 minutes left and there's a question that came from the audience that um, I think is important. And it's COVID vaccine is heavily politicized. How do you bring in key stakeholders from the faith-based community to help promote the vaccine while still being respectful of their concerns? And the question is, uh, are there certain scriptures, beatitudes, stories that you're using to reach out to your church members that you could share with this audience? Yeah, that is an outstanding question. And yes, it is highly politicized. I mean, we've seen it. Um, North Carolina, we sued the governor. Churches sued the governor so they could open back up. And so it, this has been really tough. Let me, let me say this. This is really a matter of how churches define the gospel. This is beyond denomination. This is beyond race. I think we think it's a race issue, but it's not. It's really a theological doctrinal issue. And so churches like ours, we define the gospel as both justice and justification by faith. Most of the churches that are really struggling with the vaccine, and I wanna be very clear because I don't wanna offend any audience participants. I'm generalizing when I say this, there are always exceptions, I'm generalizing. Typically speaking, though, the more conservative a church is, the more they define the gospel as strictly a matter of justification by faith, meaning I want you to get to heaven. And if you're stuck in a really bad place here on earth, no big deal. You'll leave one day and you'll go to heaven. Usually churches, the more far left, are very concerned about issues of justice on the earth. They're concerned about earth issues. Those tend to be the churches like your mainline denominations that are going to be more open and willing to participate in vaccination sites, vaccination clinics, and et cetera. And so what I, you know, what I encourage people to do is to recognize the theology and the doctrine in this argument, um, number one. And then I think the second thing for me to answer the second part of the question is we have to be, it's not a certain scripture or a certain beatitude. It is literally the ability, if anything, is love your neighbor, right? And so what I said to our congregation, because we have hesitancy within our church. I mean, we did a poll and we're at like an 81% vaccination rate in our congregation, which I'm thrilled about. Um, but I, you know, I'm consistently saying to people, this is a unique opportunity for us to put our faith on the platform and show the community that we can love them. And we, we can't squander this opportunity. And so for me, it's just a reminder for people of what we have been called to do in terms of our faith and how we get the chance to live it out missionally in front of people every day. Um, but this is unfortunately politicized because we have certain denominations that have taken on a political doctrine and not really a biblical doctrine. And I don't know that there's an easy, clean answer out of this. It's part of what 
has complicated this whole vaccination issue and part of what complicates kind of where we are as a society. There's a new question that came in and it relates to the masking guidance um, by CDC and whether or not the change in the guidance um, may have had an impact on vaccination rates. Well, I don't know who the audience is. So somebody from CDC might get, might get upset with me on this one. Um, I was very disappointed by the guidance. Um, it was very difficult to message the guidance, how you almost, you know, because we are, so the short answer is I, it absolutely has affected vaccination hesitancy and not even hesitancy. It's just kind of like, well, we're good now. We don't need it. You know, it's, it's difficult when you change your messaging midstream. And so here in North Carolina, we were shooting for 75% vaccination rate before we could say the coast is clear. You know, we're at 40 some percent, maybe 40%. And then suddenly the governor, because of the CDC guidelines says, take off your mask if you're vaccinated. And it, it left people confused. Um, we're not really, I mean, I still go, I'm fully vaccinated, but when I go into a grocery store, I still have on a mask. I was at a funeral yesterday. Everybody in the funeral had on a mask. Um, I think it has really created some complication. And I don't think there's been good messaging from CDC, even from the state level, in my opinion, of explaining to people why suddenly we didn't have to get to herd immunity and the coast was clear. So I do think it's hurt. And those of us like myself who have platforms where I get to speak to thousands of people every week, you know, we're saying to people, you know, if you're out there around other people, still wear your mask. Um, in the church, when they get around, we still are, aren't returning to full, we won't until September. So we're being super, super cautious. So I do think that has really created a complication and I just wish it, I, I do believe in following the science. And if the science says you can now unmask, I think we should have had better messaging to explain why the herd immunity is different now than what we anticipated. So I think that's an area for improvement in my opinion. I think one of our challenges is we're learning every day about this pandemic, about this virus and these new variants that come forward that make it difficult, I think, to you know, have one message and stick with it. But then it is very challenging for the public health voices, for the faith leaders, the community leaders, the elected leaders to continue to have the confidence uh, by the people that they're trying to influence. So yeah. <laughs> I appreciate all that you've been doing. And let me just give you an opportunity to, what last piece of advice would you like to share with the audience? Whether it's from your policymaking perspective, your community leadership, what, what have we not touched on that you'd like to share? Well, I don't know if it's so much we didn't touch on it as, as I may think it's just worthy of, of saying it one more time. I, I just would really encourage, and I'm biased in this, but I have an expression that just because you're biased doesn't mean you're wrong. Um, I'm biased in this, but I think that churches and faith organizations, we need to take more seriously opportunities to partner. Here in North Carolina, um, we have 100 counties. It's the only asset that's already structured and organized in all 100 counties. Such is the same throughout the country. Everywhere you go, um, there are 300,000 churches in America, 300,000. They have buildings, they have structure, they have leadership. And I think we have to really work harder at partnering with those entities. They are trusted voices. Most are not gonna proselytize on the dollar or the relationship. They really just wanna see people's lives better. And I would love to see us take on a, a more serious, more aggressive role in trying to develop out those partnerships and those networks. I think it's a huge opportunity for us. I think it will create a win-win. And I would just respectfully ask people to really, really look at those scenarios. I'll give you one quick example, Mary. We were having a hard time getting AIDS testing 15 years ago in this community. Health department was struggling. The HIV rate was going through the roof in Edgecombe County. We have one of the highest HIV rates in the country here. And they reached out to me. And I said, I'll tell you what, give me the HIV test. Give me the AIDS test. Do it in the Sunday school. 
uh, classroom of my church, bring the newspapers. I took the AIDS test and we turned three of our Sunday school classrooms into testing sites. And in two weekends, they tested more people than they had in two years. So, you know, I, I, and that's just one example, blood drives, right? Don't have a blood drive on a Friday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon at some community center. Have it on Sunday morning at a church. And when people get done worshiping and they give blood, you'll get more blood than you ever thought you'd get. So I would just encourage people to try to try, try, try these faith entities and not just Christian churches, synagogues, mosques. Um, I mean, I, you know, any faith entity that is already structured and organized, I think would prove to be a great partner. I'm just going to ask one other question related and and then I'm going to move us into some takeaways from today. But um, I know you have a very strong healthcare system and a lot of very strong hospitals. Have, has the faith community partnered up with some of those um, healthcare systems as well? Because it seems like they're also anchor organizations in communities. That is an outstanding question. And I would be remiss and I would have been remiss. So thank you for raising it. We have UNC here in Nash County. We have the UNC hospitals um, that are throughout our state. And when we started seeing, we, when we weren't happy initially with the numbers we were seeing in terms of equity and the vaccination rates, I went to the CEO of the hospital. And much to his credit, he said, you know, we were viewing this as, you know, let the health department have their piece. You know, we're going to kind of be the background organization, but if you need something, we're here. After we had a conversation, the hospital system decided to take a lead in addressing this issue. And they brought resources to the table in terms of nurses, uh, people to be able to do intakes, registration people. They really stepped up to the plate. And I have seen hospital systems throughout the state, particularly the UNC system that we're a part of, really take on key leadership. And now we have a better partnership than we've ever had before. And we're talking about the very things you raised in the beginning of this call, the conversation. What do we do next? What do we take on next? Because we trust each other. We like each other. We get used to dealing with each other. So literally now here at my church, there's a UNC vaccination clinic every single Tuesday. Uh, we great. do a morning session and an afternoon session. It's been going on for weeks and it's scheduled to go on for months. So yes, they've been a key player. Well, I had to ask that question because PHI had a wonderful partnership with Kaiser Permanente here in the state of California. And um, you know, I see that as a model for going forward. Well, let me look real quick, Mary, let me just insert the other part of that partnership is with provide with insurance companies. So here we have the UNC system, the faith entities and United Healthcare, which is one of our larger insurers who are all partnering together for future health initiatives as well. So I think it's really possible to really grow that network really large. I agree. I totally agree. If we could pull up our slide uh, that talks about some of the key takeaways. So we, we always like to end our web forums with a few of the items that we plan to talk about in our discussion. And um, we'll share all of the slides and the recording following today's event. But you know, you've heard uh, the pastor talking about creating partnerships with local and faith-based organizations to, to increase trust and confidence in the vaccine. And also the communication campaigns, which he so articulately talked about in terms of approaches being tailored and the messaging um, coming from different organizations targeting uh, the messaging not just at, on the airwaves, but in people's homes and in their communities. And building local partnerships requiring uh, shared goals and you know, trying to figure out who's not at the table. Um, and then the important role of the legislature and our elected officials to work with community stakeholders to develop long-term policy measures to improve health equity. And importantly for us to look into the future for what are our, not only public health emergencies, but the public health issues that are um, forcing people to not have the level of health that they might like to enjoy. So we hope that everyone learns something useful today and you'll have some of these takeaways and others that'll help you in your community and uh, not just during the pandemic, but as you look at what life is going to be like post-pandemic and we're moving that direction. Um, 
In the uh, slide appendix, we've also shared a few resources for developing a vaccine distribution strategy, monitoring vaccine uptake, and reducing hesitancy in your own community. So I would like to particularly thank you all for attending today's discussion. Thank you to the panelists in the first session that we had back in May, and particularly thanking uh, Pastor Galliard for his outstanding comments today. You've brought a lot of real practical examples from your community, your state, your experience as an elected official. Um, once the web forum ends, please give us your feedback via the pop-up survey and continue to stay tuned in for upcoming events. Look for getting a hold of the slides and, and you can share the recording with others. Thank you again for joining us and stay healthy.